In this video, we're going to look at how we can use non-rigid diaphragms to represent the behavior of our floor systems in situations where rigid diaphragms may not be applicable. And this involves the use of the meshing algorithms within SRAM and 2D finite elements. Now for a little bit of background, meshing is essentially the process of creating 2D finite elements using panels and then breaking them down into elements. And the finite elements that are generated, they could be shells, membranes, plates. We have more information available that within SRAM's help system. Uh, but their stiffness and their behavior will depend on the type of element it is, the shape, the thickness of the material, the actual material itself. And this allows for a more accurate representation of whatever physical component might represent uh, that might be represented by that object. Now in SRAM, there's three different types of 2D elements. There's membrane elements, which have in-plane stiffness only. So an example of this might be a fabric structure, which can be pulled, but if you push it out of plane, it's not gonna provide much of any resistance. In this case of membranes, it won't provide any resistance. We have plate elements, which have out-of-plane stiffness only. So kind of the opposite of membranes. We don't see them used as often, uh, but what they could be used is for you know, thin floor systems that do have a bit of out-of-plane stiffness, but they don't provide any in-plane stiffness. And lastly, we have, I would say, the jack of all trades out of the three of them, shell elements, which have both in and out-of-plane stiffness. And these are more commonly used to basically model anything that might be considered, um, you know, a planar object in structural engineering. That could be slabs, it could be walls, it could be foundation pads. Uh, there's a lot of other applications for them. I'm just naming a few. Now, when reviewing the results for these types of elements, the member force diagrams that we've gotten used to don't necessarily work when we're using these 2D elements uh, because they're not actual members. So we have contour results across the surface instead of member results across a member. But we've built in tools within SRAM to integrate those contour results to give us more design-ready information. So we have wall integration lines, which are useful if you're modeling walls with shell elements. And you want to look at the forces across the wall at certain heights. Wall integration lines are perfect for that. And you can actually send that information directly into the integrated concrete design or into as concrete. We also have strip integration lines, which allow you to lay basically lines across the members and allow you to interpret the results of your contour diagrams in more design-ready fashion. So looking at specific locations, uh, maybe averaging the results across a width of your floor system that might be of interest to you. So we're going to look at some examples of this in the next exercise. I should mention just off the bat here that this is a very deep topic that we're not going to go into that much detail on. If you're interested in any of the things that we talk about within this next little while, I would strongly recommend that you look into our F201 Finite Element Applications course, which actually spends three lectures, two hours each, going into detail on these types of topics. So this is really just brushing the surface. We're going to just go with a simple model here. This is the same one that we had before. Uh, you may remember that we've got these uh, floor systems represented with rigid diaphragms. However, we're actually going to change the element types. Rather than using rigid diaphragms, we're going to try a different element type. We're still going to make it somewhat consistent with the rigid diaphragms, which only have implant stiffness. So we're going to use membranes. And to do that, we're going to use the panel element tool, and we're going to change the panel element tool, or type, sorry, from the, uh, we're using the rigid diaphragm panel type right now, we're going to change this to a membrane quad mesh panel type. So I'm going to left click on this panel type. I'm going to enter a thickness for this panel of 150 millimeters. I'm also going to change the material. So it's going to just be this def concrete ST. And I'm going to enter a mesh density of 18. A mesh density basically dictates the number of elements that are generated during the meshing algorithm 
uh, runtime along the longest length of the edge, uh, longest edge of the, the panel. So if we're looking at this as a single panel, the longest edge would probably be this edge here. So we'd have 18 elements generated along that edge. And each other edge with a shorter length would be having elements generated with relative, relatively consistent sizes to that. And change the seed density to one. Again, seed density, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but it basically allows you to control how much of an increase in mesh density you apply to internal nodes within your panel that might represent column locations or joint locations that have loads applied to them. We're going to set that equal to one. And I'm going to apply that to the panel handle. So I'm just going to left click and apply, change the color of the panels there. And I'm going to run the meshing algorithm. So I'm going to click on mesh panel elements of type membrane plate or shell. And you notice what happened here is that when I click that button, SRAM generated all these membrane elements for me. These membrane elements have been assigned a material and a thickness based on the input information for that panel. And if we counted along this longest edge, we'd have 18 elements and we'd have a consistent size for the other element edges as well. So it's going to ask me here if I want to accept the mesh based on what I've entered here. And I click no or yes, depending on what I want. I click yes here. And now I can go to the quadrilateral element tool, which is actually what this meshing process has generated for us. It's generated quadri quadrilateral elements. I can left click on this tool, showing me in red here that these are all membrane elements. And I can display the thickness. So I can see I have 150 millimeter thickness. I can also use the material properties tool and see that I'm using this concrete material property. Now at this stage, I can go ahead and run an analysis. So I'll click Analyze, run a linear static analysis. The analysis will take a little bit longer than before uh, because we have so many more elements than we did in the past. But the difference now is that rather than having our floor system represented by a rigid diaphragm, which tells SRAM that this floor system is completely rigid within plane, now the floor system has a Stiffness is defined by the material properties and thickness of those membrane elements. So I can look at things like the X deflection, first of all, just like I normally would. I can see the deflection at any joint location, about six millimeters at the top, just under three at the bottom. You can see there's a lot more joints to look at the results for. I can still look at the different frames if I wanted to and see that the results are, again, fairly consistent, although they're not identical along the length of the frame. So a rigid approximation was probably OK for this, given that with these material properties and thickness, it still relatively appears that it's, or sorry, it still appears that this slab is behaving relatively rigid. The deformations aren't that much different between each joint. However, if I look at the some other results, I can see that these non-rigid diaphragms give me a lot more results than I could normally get out of this. So I can look at the Shell Contours tool. I left click on this tool. This is showing me the FX contour. That FX is basically the instantaneous normal force acting on the X face of the shell. And I'm not going to go into too much detail since this is covered in other training courses. But we can see that it clearly is varying throughout the length or throughout the area of this slab. And I can go back to the geometry window. And I could use a quadrilateral element tool and change this membrane element to a shell element. And to do that, the easiest way, I think, is to use this modify option, but just modify the type of element. So I'm going to modify type only, and I'm going to change this to a shell element. And I'm going to go to the loads window now. And I'm going to remove those area loads that I've signed already. So I'll just get rid of maybe a couple of these load cases. I'm going to get rid of the unit load, dead load, and live load load case. 
I'll press OK, and I'm going to create a new load case instead. I'm just going to call this a pressure load. And within this low case, I'll use the uniform pressure tool. And with the uniform pressure tool, I can specify a magnitude for this pressure. I'm going to say negative 2 kPa, or kilonewtons per meter squared, in the global z direction. I'm going to left click and drag my mouse around this. You can see that every single shell now is assigned its own pressure load. And I can run the analysis again for linear static analysis. So again, we get a clean solution for both our load cases. And I can look at the shell contours again. So I want to look at the shell contours for this load case. And obviously, since we have a different type of load, the results are going to look a little different. This is our global FX. I can also look at, with shells, remember, they have stiffness in plane, excuse me, in plane and out of plane. So I can look at the Z deflections, and I can see what those are. I'm getting about 11 millimeters of displacement in this one side of my slab here. And we can actually integrate contour results along a user-defined line. And there's two different ways of doing this. We can, one option here is that we can actually click three points within our mesh. So if I want to look at uh, a specific location within my mesh, I can just left click this joint here. And you can see I've got this red line following my mouse and I can left click another joint within my mesh to find the two joints I want to look at a line in between, a strip integration line. And then I'll just left click a third point to define the orientation of my local coordinate system. And then from that, up pops this little dialog, which is showing me my slab or wall design uh, strip results. And I can see here that I'm able to average this over a specific width or not, but I can see the details of this diagram along that line that I've created. Another option for us is to create a new member. And I can do that through the geometry window. I'm just going to switch tools here. Under the member type tool, I can specify a strip integration member line, uh, member type. This is a dummy member type, doesn't provide any stiffness or mass. All it's doing is it's just allowing us the option to integrate the results of our contour diagrams at predefined locations. So if I choose a strip integration line option, and then I switch to the member type or member definition tool, I can then draw in a member at any location. I'm going to just draw it across this part of my slab here. And then if I reanalyze, I'll be able to see the results at just that one location. So let me just show you that really quickly. I can do that using the strip beam integration line forces. And I can see this is a Z deflection along that point using five stations. But I might want to see uh, 100 stations, and you'll be able to pick up the different results a little bit better. I can also look at things like moments. So I can see the moments in my slab along that point. And there's other details as well that we can get into later on, like slab design details and so on. Most of this is discussed in more detail within the F201 course.